This series just lives in my brain rent free. I can't get enough of it, I'm sorry. It's just fantastic. Happy holidays. I'm Sandra. Welcome to One for the Books. Today, I'm super excited to talk to you about all of the series that I read in 2022. I have eight series that I completed. One was sci-fi and seven were fantasy. And I also had one series that I DNF'd. So I'm going to start with that one just to get it out of the way. Finlay Donovan was a mystery thriller that I picked up to read on vacation. I had heard really good things about it. It sounded really fun. But when I read Finlay Donovan was killing it, it just didn't connect for me the way that I hoped it would. Finlay's actions were very unbelievable to me. And I just felt like most of the humor of the book was directed at sort of a mom audience who feel like they're always a hot mess. I, I just don't think I'm the target audience for who that book was trying to talk to. It was entertaining. I did fly through it. I gave it three stars. But for me to want to continue in a series, I really feel like the first book needs to be four stars or above for me. So I'm not planning to read any more Finlay Donovan books. But the rest of the series that I'm going to talk about in this video were absolutely five star series. I am so stoked about all of these. I don't consider every single book in each of these series to be five stars. In fact, I don't think any of the series that I read had like an every single book was a five star book. But when taken as a whole, the series each get five stars. So let's get into it. I'm going to talk about them in the order that I read them. So that's going to kick off with The Kingkiller Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss, which I picked up in January of 2022. That series starts off with The Name of the Wind. The Kingkiller Chronicles is about a man named Quoth, who is an innkeeper, and it's told in kind of a flashback style narrative where he's telling his life story to some patrons at his inn. Quoth grows up as a bard in a kind of traveling troupe with his family. He tries to learn magic from this person that travels with their troop for a season or two. When tragedy strikes, Quoth decides to attend a very prestigious university to continue his study of magic, and his real purpose for doing so is to basically gain the skills he needs to seek revenge on the people who have wronged him. It's a very interesting kind of more grown-up style Harry Potter with like the magical academy trope that I love, but it's also uh, a lot darker. It's, you know, focused more on revenge as the primary motivation. And Quoth has these really interesting adventures that he gets into and he has no money and so he has to figure out how to continue to pay for his education. It has a lot of really interesting things going on. Unfortunately, this series is not complete. Patrick Rothfuss published the second book, which is called The Wise Man's Fear, 10 or 11 years ago, and no one really knows if and when the third book is ever going to come out. This is the only series that I'm talking about that is not complete. All the rest of them are completed, and I've completed them. But since we don't know if the King Killer Chronicles is ever going to be complete. I'm considering it complete for myself. Of all the series that I read, it is the most beautifully written. Patrick Rothfuss really has a way with words, but it's also the longest of the series as ter in terms of like the length of each individual book in the series. So keep that in mind. They are quite lengthy if you are wanting to get into it. One of my goals for 2023 is that I would like to read another story from each author that was new to me in 2022, as long as I rated their book four stars or higher. All of the series that I'm going to talk about were new to me authors this year, and obviously they're making this list, except for Finlay Donovan. All of them I'm planning to read another book of theirs in 2023. So for Patrick Rothfuss, I'm going to read The Slow Regard of Silent Things, which is a short story set in the King Killer Chronicles world. And it's from the perspective of this girl named Ari, who Quoth meets throughout his time at the university. And she is this very strange girl that lives underneath the university. So I think that'll be a fun way for me to continue that series. The second series that I read this year was Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. And this is Era One, which kicks off with The Final Empire. The Final Empire focuses mostly on Vin, who is this street urchin girl with magical abilities. And she is recruited by the leaders 
of a rebellion who want to overthrow the evil Lord Ruler. Mistborn has, I think, of all the series that I've read this year, the coolest magic system. The magic system is called Allomancy, and it revolves around being able to control metals. People who are Mistborn can control, I think, all eight types of metal. And then there are people called Mistings who can only control one type of metal. Mistborn also has, I think, two of the most interesting magical species that I was introduced to this year. One of them were called the Chandra or the Candra. I'm going to say Chandra. They're basically like shapeshifters, but they have a whole really interesting like society and culture, which you don't really get to see until the third book in the series. But that was really interesting for me personally to learn about. And then the second magical species that was introduced in the series, which I thought were super awesome, were the Coloss. Coloss are these huge hulking monsters. They're super gross. They continue to grow their entire lives, but their skin stays the same size. So when they're young, the Coloss have like very loose baggy skin. And then as they continue to grow throughout their lives, their skin gets really taut and then it kind of rips and leaves huge like exposed areas where their skin doesn't fit anymore. It's disgusting and I love it. Mistborn also has a really intriguing setting. The world itself is kind of dying. There's like always ash falling from the sky. There's mist that's very mysterious that comes in and out throughout the days. Strange creatures live in the mist. Each book in the series gets kind of bigger and more cinematic. I think of all of the books or series that I read, this is the one that would definitely definitely be well served by the big screen experience. For Brandon Sanderson, the next books of his that I'm going to tackle for my 2023 goal is I'm going to read Mistborn Era 2, which I believe is set hundreds of years in the future and has a very different sort of feeling and vibe altogether. It's more of like a Western based fantasy with guns and things like that. So I'm interested to tackle that in 2023. I know Stormlight is most people's favorite series by Brandon Sanderson but Stormlight Era 1 is a five book series and only four of the books are out. The next Stormlight book is supposed to come out in 2024. So I'm going to wait until 2024 and try and read Stormlight all in one go. Series number three is The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. In The Poppy War, the main character is this girl named Ren who has kind of an abusive home situation and so she studies very very hard in order to get accepted into this military academy. So once again, magical academy trope, which I love. That part only takes up probably the first half of the first book and the rest of the series kind of goes in a very different direction because while she's attending this military academy, her country is invaded and they go to war. And so suddenly everything that they've been learning at school is being applied in the real world. This series also has a really interesting magic system that's tied to this kind of pantheon of gods and the gods are very untrustworthy and have their own ends and goals and those don't line up with necessarily what the humans are seeking when they seek the powers of the gods. So that's all very interesting. This is a historical grimdark fantasy. It's based on some Asian history and it's just really horrific. There's really grim atrocities that take place. All of our characters here are morally gray or ambiguous, and our main character, Rin, ends up committing some of the atrocities herself. And so a lot of the critiques that I've heard of the Poppy War series is that people just don't like her, and that's totally understandable. But this series just lives in my brain rent-free. It, it, it just really hit me hard. And maybe it's because it's the first grimdark fantasy series that I had ever read, but I was just blown away by this story and the epicness of it. Um, and it's it stuck with me the longest. So for 2023, I am planning to read Babel by R.F. Kuang, which is a different book entirely, not related at all to the Poppy War, but that is about a young man, I believe, that attends Oxford as part of a language translation society or something like that. So I'm very excited to read more of Arf Kwong because I've heard really good things about Babel. After the Poppy War, I read The First Law by Joe Abercrombie, and this one kicks off with the blade itself. I did not realize I was reading two Grimdarks in a row, but this is another Grimdark series. The setting of this one 
is there is this country called the Union, and they are being basically invaded on both sides by the North and the Gurkish Empire to the south. The first book starts out with three main point of view characters. We have Logan Ninefingers, who's from the North. He's very Viking-esque and barbaric, and he's a very interesting character. Then we have Gisaldan Luthar, who is from the Union. He's just a very like rich, spoiled nobleman that wants to compete in this kind of like knights tournament to gain respect and accolades and get more ladies. He's extremely annoying. And then there's Sandan Glotka, who is an inquisitor for the Union. He was a prisoner of war in the Gurkish Empire for uh, a number of years in his younger days. And because of that, he's very disfigured and jaded about the world. And he has uh, constant chronic pain and he's just one of the most interesting characters that I have ever read and I think most people who have read these books would agree. The characterization that Joe Abercrombie pulls off is just exquisite. That being said, the first book really lacks in plot. For me, I love like a, a strong plot to pull me through and so the first book I did not feel as strongly about because it's really just a big long setup and an introduction to these characters. The second book gets a lot better about that and the third book I thought personally was the best of the series. It gets super epic, there's lots of battle, and I really thought the series got better with every book. So my next Joe Abercrombie that I plan to read in 2023 is called Best Served Cold and it is a standalone book in the First Law world. Next up I read Book of the Ancestor by Mark Lawrence. This starts off with Red Sister. Book of the Ancestor follows our main character, Nana, who is a young girl whose parents sell her, and she ends up at this convent called Sweet Mercy, which again is kind of our magical academy trope. I can't get enough of it. I'm sorry. Book of the Ancestor also has a very interesting, unique world setting where the world is basically encased in ice. The only habitable zone on the entire planet is this equatorial zone, but the ice continues to creep in further and further each year, which is pushing the cultures who live in that zone closer and closer together and causing a lot more conflict. That doesn't become as relevant until books two and three. The side characters I thought in this series were very compelling compelling. And again, this is another one that I just thought got better with every single book in the series. I flew through these. They were super short and I loved it. In 2023, I plan to pick up The Prince of Thorns, which is the first book in the Broken Empire series by Mark Lawrence, which I believe is his more popular and earlier series. Then in September, I read The Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin, which kicks off with the fifth season. The fifth season has three point of view characters, Essen, Cyanite, and Maya. Essen's point of view is second person, where it says, you do this, you did that, instead of the normal first person or third person that stories are told in. And I know that throws a lot of people off. That did not bother me whatsoever. I read Choose Your Own Adventure books when I was a child and those were told in that kind of uh, voice. And so that doesn't bother me. I did think it was a really interesting storytelling dynamic because she was the only one whose point of view we heard like that. And it doesn't even continue throughout the entire series. So if that does bother you, but you like the story overall, you can just power through it. In The Broken Earth, the world is torn apart on a regular basis by these cataclysmic, like seismic or climactic events. The culture has kind of evolved to prepare for these, which they call seasons. Um, and so the fifth season is the one that's really bad. But there are these people called Origines who have the ability to create, control, or quell these seismic events. And so they are strictly cataloged and controlled by the state in order to keep them from having power. They're just systemically oppressed. The normal citizens of the world really fear and despise Origines. And so they live very unfortunate lives most of the time. Origines can be born to non-Origine parents, which creates some really interesting dynamics. Sometimes those children are just like outright murdered by their own parents because they are so hated and feared. And so Essen, Sinai, and Demaya are all origins. They're all at different points of their lives. And um, so we get to see kind of what it's like to be part of this systemically oppressed group of people. And there's a lot of great 
themes in this book, which are explored like motherhood and climate change and oppression. I really liked what N.K. Jemison had to say on those topics and the way that she said them. The story was just really, really intriguing. N.K. Jemison also introduced a magical species that I was very intrigued by called the Stone Eaters, which are, they're like beings made of stone, uh, kind of like the weeping angels from Doctor Who. They are very unsettling to interact with for normal humans and they make everyone very uncomfortable. They don't really move in a way that looks natural. And so I just really loved all the interactions that people had with stone eaters. Oh, and this is um, the only one that I actually own, the full set. <laughs> so uh, not on ebook. My next plan dived into N.K. Jemison is going to be The City We Became, which is book one of the Great Cities duology. The second to last series that I completed in 2022 was The Expanse by James S.A. Corey, and that kicks off with Leviathan Wakes. So our setting for The Expanse is the solar system. Earth, Mars, and the belt have this kind of Cold War-esque standoff with each other. Tensions are high. Earth and Mars have this eternal power struggle. Earth and Mars governments and militaries both just completely exploit the belt for their resources and oppress the people through doing that because the belt has no real centralized government or power structure or military. A lot of tension between all three of these different cultural groups. It starts off with two point of views. We have James Holden, who is the exo of an ice hauler ship called the Canterbury, and Miller, who is is a detective on Siri Station in the Belt, and he is assigned to find Julie Mao, the missing daughter of this billionaire business mogul. Very early on in the book, a piece of alien tech is discovered, and it completely changes the dynamics of all of these governments and cultures and religions and the future of the human race, as you can imagine. So that's really the kickoff to the whole series. This is the longest by far of all of the series. It is nine books in total. It is complete and I just completed it in November. Each book has, I feel, a wider and wider scope as the name The Expanse kind of indicates because once that alien tech is discovered, our view of humanity expands beyond our own solar system and out into the expanse of space. But despite the huge epic scale of the series as it continues on, we always have perspective of James Holden to ground us in this world. Every book has multiple point of view characters, but Holden is the constant throughout all of them. Miller also reappears in multiple um, different books. But we also get these new people introduced in each book that give us different perspectives on maybe the politics or the religion or the science or just the general citizenship of what's happening and how it affects these different groups. I know a lot of people that have started this series but not finished it yet. And I just have to say, please keep reading. I feel like this series gets better and better as it goes along. Book five was my favorite um, when I had read books just one through five. And then book six ended up being my least favorite out of the nine book series. Most of these books had like two to five point of view characters with each book. For some reason, book six, they had like 20 point of view characters. And some of them you only had for a single chapter. And I just ended up not caring about a lot of them because I didn't get to know them very well. And that just fell a little flat for me. But the story was still very, very good. None of these books got less than four stars from me. But then I thought books uh, seven, eight, and nine were better. Each one of them was better than books one, two, and three. So if you've only read like the first three books of the series, like please keep going. Like the best by far is yet to come. In the end, I, I think book five and book eight uh, overall were my favorites. Book eight is one of only two books books that I read this year that made me cry. So I always have to give a little a little boost to books that like really hit me in the emotional feels uh, because that's a rare thing for me. After book six, there is a 30 year time jump, but unlike a lot of series which are very long where it feels like, oh, this was just a cash grab by the authors or they just felt the need to like keep going because it was successful. That's totally not the case with The Expanse. The last three books, even though there is a 30 year time jump, like you can, you can tell it was planned from the beginning to end that way. The setup was all there and the 30 year time jump totally makes sense for the story that they wanted 
wanted to tell. Like I said, the last three books were just so, so good. The series overall explores a lot of really great themes, what it means to be human, rebellion, government and corporation, power structures. I mean, it's just fantastic. I cannot physically talk about this series without also mentioning the TV adaptation, which you can watch on Prime Video. I adore this series. I've been a huge fan of Star Trek and Doctor Who and Battlestar Galactica and like all these, you know, Firefly, all these great sci-fi series over the course of my life. The Expanse is my favorite. I think they followed the books really closely. It was masterfully done. The special effects are amazing. The acting is phenomenal. Like the people they chose to play these characters are the characters. I just can't. I loved the show so much that it's what inspired me to read the books. So I highly, highly encourage you if for some reason you pick up one of the books and you can't get into it, watch the show and it'll totally change, um, I think, how you view the books because it's just masterful. I only read the nine novels that were in the series. I believe there is also eight short stories and novellas that go along with it that aren't necessarily integral to the plot, but just tell other kind of pieces of what's going on in the galaxy. All of those have been compiled into a novel length book called Memories Legion. And so that is my 2023 pick to continue reading another piece of work by James S.A. Corey. So it'll be really fun to re-enter this universe that I love so much. Oh, my foot is falling asleep. Ugh. The very last series that I read in 2022 was The Memoirs of Lady Trent by Marie Brennan, which kicks off with A Natural History of Dragons. This was by far the shortest uh, books of any series that I have read this year. Most of them were like around the 330 page mark. So, you know, compared to say The Expanse, which each book is over 500 pages. These books were very short and easy to get through. So The Memoirs of Lady Trent is a Victorian era historical fiction. It's about Isabella who in the first book, she starts off as a young girl and she's obsessed with dragons and science. And she's like sneaking books out of her father's library and is not interested in ladylike things and etiquette that was expected of women at the time. So she chafes against all these restrictions that are placed upon her by being a woman and she really just wants to study dragons. This book is a fictionalized memoir series in which Isabella is now an old woman. She is the famed and respected Lady Trent who has the renown of someone in our society like Jane Goodall. Lady Trent basically was the pioneer in the field of like dragon zoology. So Lady Trent as an old woman is telling the story of her life through these memoirs. The first book talks through when she is a young girl all the way up through her debut as an eligible bachelorette, her marriage, and then her very first expedition to study dragons. The subsequent four books in the series, it is a five book series, all cover another expedition that Isabella goes on to different parts of the world to study the dragons that live in a different part of the world. And so one is in like the jungle swamp area. One of them, she's at sea, one she's in the desert, one she's in the mountains. Um, and so in addition to getting these really interesting uh, locations, uh, we also get to experience the cultures of those places, which are very different from the kind of Victorian European style uh, life that she has as a, as a lady. So we get to be with Isabella as she explores and interacts with these new cultures and customs and doing dangerous feats and exploring challenging terrain in order to study the dragons that live in all of these areas. So I absolutely adore this series. As someone with a scientific background myself, I understand what it's like to be an outnumbered woman in a field. As a young child, it was also the type of person that was catching bugs and trying to study things on my own. So I just really related to Isabella. As you can see, I just absolutely adored this. This, I feel like of all of the series I read is the most underrated. Um, I think this book only has like a 3.8 or something on Goodreads. And I gave this first book a five stars. So maybe this isn't for everyone. It is a bit slow and it's not just like a crazy adventure tale about dragons. It's really just about the trials and tribulations of a woman struggling against the patriarchy and cultural expectations in order to live her dream of studying dragons. 
conditions. It includes things like language barriers and disease and money and balancing respect for the Native cultures with the desire to do science and the sort of barriers that that, that creates. There's a cool new dragon species in every book, sometimes multiple cool new dragon species that you get to learn about. There's some interesting archaeology thrown in and some very lovable side characters. There is a little bit of romance even in a couple of the books, but Isabella is very scientifically minded and so it's not super swoony or anything like that, but it is a very lovely subplot. I loved it. The covers are just gorgeous. Of this series, I definitely think book two is the weakest of them. It has, you know, second book syndrome where the whole first half of the book, I just felt like got really caught up in like the politics of the culture that she was visiting. And it just had like a lot of place names and people's names and statuses and titles and all these things. And it just kind of all got muddled in my head. And I was like, this isn't anything like the first book that I loved so much. But then the second half of the book gets going and it just is beautiful from there. And every other book in the series was just as good. So I absolutely recommend this book. If you love this book and you read the second one and then you're like, oh, I don't really know if I want to go through the rest of the series, it's super worth it because the books three, four, and five are a lot more like the first and don't suffer the same issues that the second book had, in my opinion. The fifth book also took a very interesting turn that I did not see coming, which was pretty freaking cool. So for 2023, my next book by Marie Brennan is going to be Turning Darkness into Light which is in the same world, but is not a memoir of Lady Trent. I believe the main character of Turning Darkness into Light is Isabella's granddaughter. So I'm excited to read that in 2023 and see how it goes. Those are the eight series that I completed in 2022. I really hope that you got something out of this video or you got excited about some of these series that I enjoyed. I can't wait to continue reading these authors again in 2023 and trying out quite a few more series that I'm very excited about. Let me know down in the comments below some of your favorite series that you completed this year was or what series you're looking forward to in 2023. As always, be kind, read books, hit the like and subscribe button below for more bookish content to come.